Okay, hello everybody, thanks for coming. Um, this panel is called Theatre in Between Live Action, Virtual Reality and Cinema, Crew's Hamlet Encounters. So it's going to address Hamlet Encounters, which is a theatre work in progress by the Russell-based company Crew. And on my left here is the founder of Crew, Eric Yoris, artist director. And on my right is Kiel Kattenbelt, who is from Utrecht University and is a scholar in intermediality. No doubt you've read some of his stuff. Um, I'm in the middle. Um, I, um, I'm sort of semi-retired, but uh, I'm still a professorial fellow at the Central School of Speech and Drama uh, in London. And you'll gather from that that my background is really in theatre, but I've worked in, over the years in theatre and television and a little bit in cinema, but I'm not a film specialist. So, um, that's who we are. I'm going to speak first, and uh, then Kiel, and then Eric. And I'm going to read a paper, because I, otherwise if I add it in, I won't get through in time. So, um, Crew, as I say, is an experimental company based in Brussels, which aims to visualise how technology is changing us. Indeed, Crew's work historically has involved innovative exploration of media technologies, HDV, ODV, mocap, in theatre installation events such as Terra Nova. And if you don't know Terra Nova, there's a very good YouTube clip that you can check out. It's crewonline.org. Uh, yes, yeah, right. Worth visiting. Okay. But this a work in progress, Hamlet Encounters, is the working title of Crew's engagement with Shakespeare's Hamlet which is set to emerge as some kind of theatre event in uh, 2019. And the work in progress by way of an installation is, has already been shown in Gdansk, in Brussels, in Belgrade, and it's here. And some of you have experienced it this morning. Um, it's a short five minute version of the HDV installation. So, slide please here. One more. Okay, so for me, this project's both a creative practice and a research inquiry through the practice, because one of the things in which I specialise in is um, research through arts practices. Now, my first task today is to give a brief account of Hamlet's encounters so that you have some idea what we're talking about. Subsequently, my contribution seeks to home in on the experience in the context of intermediality. We needed to bring to Cluj the experience live, as it were, because no account of the process and the installation can convey how it feels. It's an obvious point, but worth making, that we cannot show you Hamlet encounters as we could if it were a film, because the encounters lie ultimately in the experience of those who engage. Feedback from everywhere we've presented informs us that the experience is something other than the visual verbal account of it. So we urge you, if possible, to come and try the experience. But since most of you won't yet have had the chance, I'll start with some illustration of the process and the product to give you some sense of the vehicle we're discussing. Please. Next slide. Oh, that's the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you can't get the assistance these days. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to get this one. This one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so th this is uh, when we were in Gdansk, and is somebody experiencing. Are we going to pick it up? No. One yeah. more? No. One more? Okay, sorry. There we are. Um, this is somebody experiencing the installation. So as you see, you put on a VR headset and you move through a space that's marked within the environment with a red line, but you can see the shape of it there. Um, ideally, we have a bigger space, but it works in a space this size. Um, okay, we'll just go through the slides again. Yeah, twice, yeah. So... One of the environments you go into is a castle environment, and you meet there actors playing scenes from Hamlet. And you can walk amongst the actors, and they can walk amongst you. Indeed, they can walk through you. And you can, in fact, if you want, put your head in their bodies. Okay, this is an interesting experience. Yeah. So, how did this process come about? So, the actors recorded the scenes from Hamlet in motion capture suits in Crew Studio in Brussels. 
Okay. So here we have the actor playing Polonius being scanned in his costume. So for a very brief time we wore our costumes just long enough to be scanned. So the scan then goes into the computer system. Then we, we do the acting in mocap suits and then um, that's all put together obviously in a technological process through the computer. Okay. And then the costumes that we're scanned in get dropped on us in the environment. So we're like avatars. It's a bit like those dolls things you used to put costumes on, you remember that? And then it comes together in the space. So here we have Polonius in the castle environment, moving in the environment. And as you'll notice, his face is covered by a bubble, a white bubble. And within the environment, when you see those bubbles, Eric, who will lead you through the experience, will invite you to put your head in the bubble. And when you put your head in the bubble, you go somewhere else. And at the moment, that somewhere else is back to the studio in Brussels, so you can see the process of how it's been done. But in fact, that then becomes a feed space, so other uh, things, when we, as the work develops, could be fed through that feed space. So you could go into other kinds of environments, you could have film inserts and all kinds of things in that environment. So it becomes, um, it's a theatre experience. In, the sen in one sense, you are the actor. You're the, you're the main actor in it. And it, what we're kind of trying to do is give you experience of being Hamlet as if Hamlet was in the 21st century. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on. Okay, is that all my slides now? I think, yes it is. Okay, so I'll return now to my script. So, uh, for the Hamlet, in, uh, I'll just sum up. For the Hamlet Encounters installation, experiences put on a VR headset and find themselves immersed in the world of Hamlet that is to say, in a castle environment through which avatars of Hamlet, Ophelia, Gertrude, Polonius and the ghost move freely, even walking through you, you too can move freely through the environment, even entering their bodies. The fragments of Hamlet action you encounter are mobilised by a recording of actual actors playing the scenes in mocap in Crew's Brussels studio. The studio, the studio process is captured on 360 degree film such that the installation experiences can look fully around in the environment but not move through it. So there's an important distinction there between the film bit in the studio and the full VR environment. In the studio bit you can look around you but you can't move through it. But in the VR environment you can move through it. So it's in part a film experience but with a difference. Digital technology then puts costumes on the motion-captured actors and locates the avatars in Elsinore Castle. Within the VR castle environment, bubbles afford access to the process of production. Okay. So there's a lot we might say about the complexity of the process, about our engagement with Shakespeare's Hamlet, about the ways technology surprises you, about the difficulties of developing what is at present a short installation into a full theatre experience. And Eric will shortly address some of these matters. But in the context of this screen conference and its focus on intermediality and in-betweenness, I propose now to address the idea of the experiencer. An emphasis on the phenomenal reflects a shift in our thinking related to the rapid development of digital circumstances from the 1990s through Web 2 to the present. This moment, according to a UK colleague Andy Lavender, involves a cultural scene that is much more routinely mixed, where boundary crossing has become so commonplace that the boundary is less noticeable than the journey, and the move from one entity to another less pertinent than the feeling of being amid transition. Lavender further remarks that, next slide please. Thank you. If media mixity is now a norm of cultural production, we become interested not so much in the what and the how of media interrelations, questions to do with form, function, and technological adaptation, as the so what and to what end. In which case, we're interested in intermediality's affects, the actions it performs or permits, and its affordances for pleasure, participation, empowerment. So I, I was struck, having listened to Thomas this morning, that I'm talking about a completely different angle on the experience of screens, screen media, if you like. So the emphasis has shifted, in short, 
to the phenomenal. In 2006, in the context of the Theatre and Intermediality Research Group, which Kiel founded and I've been a part of for many years, Kiel emphasised the gap produced by the process of digitisation. The inevitable, quote, gap in between the units, even if that gap is not perceptible to the human eye. By 2010, however, I was suggesting in a subsequent book that the group wrote, in, in preference to, quote, various co conceptions of the in-between, we've come to think that the compound both and better characterizes contemporary performance culture. The second iteration points up that when elements come together, they might bang against each other in disjunction rather than dissolve in conjunction. In Hamlet Encounters, I suggest that you are both in virtual space and in actual space, and there's a free sign of experience in the both and of being in two spaces. Now, for me, that's not the same as uh, an in-between or dissolving the two together. You, it's both and, you're in both spaces at once, is what I'm arguing. The slight dislocations you experience are both of the body and the mind. In contemporary theatre practice, there's a strong trend towards creating an experience for those who attend, rather than present a play with a beginning, middle and an end, and a notional received meaning. Whilst much theatre still seats people in serried ranks in the dark to optimise visual cognitive focus upon the stage event, Cutting-edge contemporary practice often takes people on a physical journey with embodied encounters of various kinds on the way. The work of blast theory, if you know it, or of punch drunk, will be emblematic. Similarly, so-called theater in the dark shifts the sensual focus from the eye, but in this case to what we might call the embodied ear, because the aim is to do more than simply recreate radio. These offerings of new experiences to theatre-goers bears up my coinage of the experiencer in place of audience and spectator to draw attention to the embodied eye and ear, indeed to the engagement of the full sensorium. At the same time, renewed critical attention to synesthesia has called in question Aristotle's five senses to suggest a much more complex and integrated sensorium. But what might be said of film in respect of experience? Film is a medium typically projected in darkened cinemas. The body is effaced such that the eye-mind relation is dominant. In this respect, it parallels traditional theatre as its conventions have evolved. Unlike theatre, however, live interaction is not possible with a pre-recorded celluloid or now digital product. But in a seminal essay, What My Fingers Knew, in her 1995 book, Carnal Thoughts, Viv Vivian Sobchak challenged a cinema culture in which sight is the dominant sense and the eye-mind mode root to cognition, the dominant way of understanding film. She argues not only that cinema going is an embodied experience, but there is a history of intermittent explorations of this spectator in Krakauer's phrase as a corporeal material being. She reminds us that Eisenstein spent the latter part of his career investigating, quote, the synchronization of the senses, and that Benjamin speaks of cinematic intelligibility as, quote, tactile appropriations. Marking other allusions through time to what she calls, quote, the carnal foundations of cinematic intelligibility, Subject nevertheless notes that contemporary film theory tends to sustain, quote, the idealist assumption that human experience is originally and fundamentally cognitive. She concludes, positing cinematic vision as merely a mode of objective symbolic representation and reductively abstracting, disincarnating the spectator's subjective and full-body vision to posit it only as a distance sense, contemporary film theory has had major difficulties in comprehending how it is possible for human bodies to be, in fact, really touched and moved by the movies. Since my focus today is on the experience of Hamlet Encounters project, I leave Keel in a moment to take up the question of media affordances 
and how they might situate us in respect of the organisation of space and time and embodied knowing. I simply note here that Kiel argues for a performative semiotics derived from C.S. Pierce, which allows us to avoid the binary separation of meaning and experience. Hamlet Encounters takes up Sobchak's notion of a multi-sensual screen reader experience, but goes beyond the haptic visuality of traditional cinema. Part of the experience, as I've said, is indeed cinematic, but the ability to look around the 360 degree film studio affords a choice of perspective precluded by classic cinema. So what kind of experience is Hamlet Encounters? First, I should say, we are not interested in creating a VR production of Hamlet in which experience <laughs> simply feel more fully immersed in the world of the play. There is a group in America currently working on exactly such a version of Hamlet. In contrast, we're interested not in the ultimate illusions of the uncanny valley, but rather in the complex inside-outside experiences of augmented reality. What experiences are encountering in the VR is projected onto a screen while you are waiting, such that you get a sense, a sense of the process, but also see how the outside experience is different from the inside. The play between them is what ultimately refunctions perception. In this live theatre event version, um, the, what we're planning is a kind of playground of various experiences. So you won't just have the VR experience, but, but you'll have other kinds of experiences, which Eric Pester will talk about later. Um, and they will play against each other. And that inside-outside is what I find personally the most interesting thing. Okay, for me, disjunctive relations, the both ands in intermedial mixes, are more interested than the conjunctive total theatre relations, such as sought in different ways by Wagner in the Gesamtkunstwerk and Kandinsky in his stage compositions. It's the probing of the juxtaposed affordances of various mediums and modes that we find most affecting. Moving tentatively through virtual space, you must negotiate also the actual space as well as entering through the bubbles of other spaces. For example, the requirement to descend the stairs of the castle on your virtual journey makes for an interesting negotiation of actual space. And some of you had that experience this morning. And it's very interesting. You're on a flat floor, but everybody's going down uh, feeling for the handrail. <laughs> um, Invited to sit down on a chair in the virtual world, you find yourself sitting on an actual chair, only perhaps to find the virtual queen might come to sit on your lap. Finally, you might fly backwards through space into a universe of stars. These spaces do not dissolve into one another, but rather clash with each other with dislocating impacts upon the body-mind and with distinctive affects. Rather than construct the experience afforded as in-between mediums, I propose that they might be considered as both and. It is the double or triple being simultaneously in a number of worlds, which for me is most affective. And to repeat, I'm not in between these worlds, but inhabiting each simultaneously in a way which dislocates my normative perceptual co coordinates and opens up new ways of experiencing space and possible worlds. Similarly, one might speak not so much of experience in between the live and the mediatized, but of another both and. It's both live and it's mediatized simultaneously. In the lineage of the avant-garde or Brecht perhaps, we seek disjunctions which dislocate bearings and disturb the sensorium with a view to new modes of perception. We're not seeking to mount a production of Hamlet, Rather, we're seeking ultimately to locate the experiencer in the position of Hamlet, confronting a time which is out of joint and a space in which no one can be trusted. It's a paradigm, I suggest, for the 21st century. And I'm just going to finish with a couple of remarks on this. Cue, thanks. If the early 17th century marks the rise of science and the nascent enlightenment, does the early 21st century mark its demise? That's one of the ideas that we're playing with here. So Hamlet, at the beginning of the 17th century, is placed in a conflicted world. 
jump forward to the early 21st century, we're in a conflicted world, and if we can put people at the centre of that world to engage with it, that's one of the thoughts in process here. Secondly, today's notion of fake news challenges not just the truth of a matter, but the very means by which that truth might be established. And that's part of that condition of complexity that we're looking for. And finally, the quest for truth and exposure of falsity runs through Hamlet. I would argue, obviously there's many readings of Hamlet, but I would argue that Hamlet is put in a position where he can't trust anybody, and the epistemologies, all his bearings on the world, are dislocated. And he has to find a way through that. That's, if you like, the model that we're looking at. So Hamlet's encounters aims ultimately to situate, to situate you in the melee of the early 21st century and ask you how it is possible to act ethically in a conflicted world. The end. Thank you. So technology always surprises you. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, so I would like to say a few things about our project in terms of how uh, Hamlet Encounters is very much a matter of staging media and playing with our senses. I would like to start with a few words about my uh, approach, uh, my focus and my interest. I always start from what I call a pragmatic and phenomenological approach to aesthetic communication and a comparative approach to media, art and performance. So my assumption is that experience and expression are inextricably linked and perceiving is also by definition a matter of performing. My focus is on theatre, film, uh, 360 degrees or omnidirectional video and virtual reality. So I use the concept of virtual reality in a more narrow sense than it is usually uh, used. And my interests are in uh, the use of digital technologies in the live performance in terms of how the technologies play with the experiences senses and how the experiences are positioned by the technologies used and how uh, they provide the experience uh, with specific affordances and agencies. So to say it very briefly, I'm mainly interested in what the media do with us and what we do with the media. And I, in particular, focus on how we use media for the purpose of playing, performing, and participating. Something like that. Um, all my thinking is in terms of triad. I'm very much, as Robin already mentioned, by Charles Sanders Peirce, but not only by him. We find these triads, of course, also very much in Kant's uh, uh, aesthetic uh, theory. So there are many uh, great thinkers uh, who also try to uh, conceptualize all in terms of uh, three concepts that you can only understand in having a sense of how they relate to one another. It's more or less also an, uh, um, an answer to, on the one side, we have this very much on unity and harmony uh, focused uh, uh, idea of thinking and in opposite to that uh, thinking in terms of uh, difference or distinction whereas my only idea of harmony or unity only consists in the, in the distinctiveness of its elements. So the distinction is always incorporated in the unity so to say. Well here is a, uh, some of these triads that I use. I had also in mind to say a few things about the changes in how I use the concept of intermediality, but Robin already addressed that. 
And so the focus was originally very much on the co- and interrelations between media and how they redefine each other and how they resensibilize our perception. And in the second instance, I introduced this idea that maybe intermediality is very much uh, to be considered as a specific mode of uh, performativity, which I consider as an inherent aspect of all art, something like that. But I won't go into uh, that for now. One of the things I'm very much interested in is the specificity of media we're working with. And I'm very much aware that no medium exists on its own, so it's always related to another media. And having a sense of the specificity of a medium is always from a media comparative approach. So making sense of what's specific for one medium is only because we know how it is different or uh, in what sense it has some features in common with other media. And of course we, have, we use the concept of medium on all kinds of levels and since uh, the uh, 90s from the last century it's very uh, uh, people very frequently use the word medium where we used before way more words like uh, sign and sometimes we, they refer with the word medium to sign systems but also to institutional practices or to different technologies so there are all kinds of ideas about how media could be defined uh, uh, in, in, in what sense and how they might relate to one another. But again, my medium specificity idea is always related to um, uh, how it frames and puts into pe perspective what, that, what it presents, how it positions and addresses uh, its audience, how it relates to specific affordances and how it provides specific modes of agency. Um, so yes, being specific by comparison. Um, I will briefly go through the media I'm focusing on. Uh, what we notice when theatre is compared to other media, uh, in particular when it is compared to film theatre, is often conceived as proscenium arch theatre, actually taking place in what Hegel would call the absolute presence of the here and now, with all the specific uh, uh, features that come with it, so to say. So theatre is uh, taking place in a three-dimensional physical space, or three-dimensional physical stage, strictly separated from the auditorium. Uh, perceived by the spectator within a fixed frame as a spatial totality, uh, which implies that the perspective and distance from which the stage is perceived is fixed, are fixed as well. Something like that. And I'm very much aware that this is a very specific idea of theatre, although for a long time very much uh, uh, considered to be the dominant model. And all of us, we can easily fantasize about all kinds of examples of and experiences with theatre is all but based on this very frontal system of presentation. That's clear. And that is even more so when we use uh, technologies like screens and so on in the live performance. Uh, when it comes to film, uh, the history of film is often <coughs> treated as the film's emancipation from the frontality of theatrical modes of presentation. Which means with camera movements and changes of camera position, the frontality of theatre is broken through. Film art requires flexibility in perspective and distance, instead of the fixed perspective and distance, which was considered to be characteristic for theatre. So it's playing with magnitude, that's another way of saying it. And close-ups uh, obviate the need for stylization and exaggeration in acting as we know it from the theatre, and artificial presentations of space are replaced by natural sights. This is very dominant idea of film. And of course, again, we can easily fantasize about all films in which is this absolutely not the case. But I would like to refer, in this case, to Peter Greenaway, who is still arguing all the time against cinema in its dominant form, form still, so to say, hanging around in the 19th century, based on principles that weren't invented by those who invented the camera, but were actually invented 
by authors like Tolstoy or Flaubert, who knew how affected, effective it could be if the narrator hides, so to say, him or herself between the world as it is presented in the novel, whether or not for the sake of identification or whatsoever. Something like that. So yes, with movement, uh, so um, and out of yeah, so that's so to say the characteristics of uh, film, um, and then a few words about um, the the being specific of uh, wearing uh, goggles, so to say, head-mounted display that actually connects the experiencer visually from the physical space around him or her and radically redefines his or her eyes, which immediately affects the appropriate the, the proprioception of the body. So there, where usually the digital is considered as a kind of dematerialization, you could say at the same time, oh yes, we are not having access anymore, so to say, to the physical world around us with our eyes and ears, and which are characterized by the uh, psychologists who deal with perception as the distance senses. There was also mm -hmm. a reference mm -hmm. in the quote from uh, Sobchak. Mm -hmm. But it makes us actually aware to what extent the whole body is actually involved in the process of perception. Mm -hmm. And this brings me actually to um, the idea when we talk about perception, and that also relates to uh, Eisenstein and others who were also very much aware of this, uh, this, this so-called uh, impact of the moving image on the human body. And so that um, it, um, perception is on the one side, I mean we can only do one thing with our senses, namely to observe distinctions. Without change, without distinction, without movement, perception is impossible. We know from all kinds of experiments, as soon as that what we perceive doesn't change with regard to the sense, it immediately disappears. So if you would fix a projected image directly to the eye, and the eye can't move with relation to the image, immediately the image disappears. So with regard to seeing, for instance, you need movement in order to see something. Whether it be that the object itself moves, whether it be that the eye moves when the object itself is fixed, so to say. So, on the one side, we only can make distinctions, be aware of distinctions. At the same time, in order to relate to what we perceive, we have to synchronize in one way or the other, as also mentioned by uh, Eisenstein. And so, we have to, in one way or the other, relate to what we perceive by actually listening to how to understand what the perceptual input actually does with the body. And that's what I emphasize as, as the media playing with uh, the senses. So the senses are in a way redefined, which make us aware how much actually the brain and the body uh, can't be uh, considered as separate from one another. To a large extent, even without any technology, if we really focus on it and, for instance, uh, look around in a space like this, how we experience this space is to a large extent related to how we are positioned in this space, all kinds of movements that we make with our eyes and body, which is also input for the mind in order to understand the space we are actually in. As I said, I make a clear distinction between omnidirectional video and VR. In the case of omnidirectional video, I would say there is more or less the position as it is inscribed in the space you're in is fixed, it's recorded, so you can see it from a fixed point or you can travel in that space along a specific trajectory, but it's actually decided by how it is pre-recorded in uh, when the space was uh, uh, when the space was recorded, so to say. Whereas in the case of virtual reality, you are actually in a virtual space that you can actively explore yourself. That's to say you can walk around in that space, you decide, so to say, about framing, you decide about perspective and distance, so you can actually play with the tools, which, and that's actually my basic idea, 
was actually uh, that what is in the hand of the cinematographer. The cinematographer is the one who would like to have control about framing distance and perspective. What happens if you place someone in a virtual space and leave these decisions to the one who is actually in that space? That's not completely true, but it's interesting to wonder what are the implications and consequences of this. Because to a large extent we still have this idea that a being surrounded by a virtual space is more or less the same as the immersive quality of film. And I think that whatever you would, however you would like to define the concept of immersion, we should definitely make a distinction between, so to say, diving into the world beyond, diving into the space, so to say, beyond the screen, where the screen gives us access to, or where we are actually surrounded by our own physical space, which is virtual that are two different things. And it was interesting to see, for instance, during the Cine Dance Festival in Amsterdam uh, this year, where the virtual reality technology was given to choreographers. To choreographers. I mean, a choreographer is by definition working with the human body. Even if the choreographer doesn't focus so much on the moving body, but his, the, the, the human corporeal body is, so to say, his material. What can a choreographer do with virtual reality? And of all the installations that I saw, it one thing was clear, they all had to deal with the fact that the physical body of the one who is immersed in this virtual space has disappeared. What to do with the body that has disappeared and at the same time the experience which makes you in an intensified way aware of your physical body. In particular, where indeed where Robin was referring to, where you go down the stairs, where you actually know there are no stairs. It's a flat uh, uh, floor I'm standing on. And this idea of the proprioception that is very much related to all this is also, I think, the, ins the, the, the interesting starting point where we go maybe in the future also in the direction of robotics. Because whatever a robot can do, it doesn't it can't be equipped in such a sophisticated way as the human body with indeed this sense of balance, this sense of the experience and awareness of the physical body. In that sense it's interesting again to relate to an, uh, a, a dance performance, in this case by Katja Heitman, who made a performance called, uh, what was it called, um, Pandora's Dropbox. And in this performance, she tries to slow down the movement of the human body to the limit, mm. so to say, in order to see where actually this idea of the human body as a kind of machine comes into our awareness. Where, in my experience, it became clear that it uh, takes a lot of exercise of training in order to move as slow as she wanted the dancers to move is really exhausting them. It's becoming so difficult by not moving to keep the whole body upright that you become only of one thing and that's here are suffering human bodies on stage and not machines. So yes, my story is all about playing the senses how media are uh, uh, staged, and I still believe in this idea that theatre can uh, very well um, function as a hyper medium. That's to say, it can literally incorporate other media without immediately affecting the uh, materialities of the media as they are used. So, in the case of uh, a theatrical performance, it's not so much about uh, a sense of remediation in in which one medium is represented by another medium, but where actually we provide uh, with uh, the theatrical space a space where the media can be staged and, so to say, played out against each other. And in that sense also mm -hmm. playing again with our senses. Okay, that's, that's it. Go. That's my <laughs> <point>. <laughs> Okay. There. Yeah.
May I comment? Makes it easy for me. Uh, well, first of all, uh, so, so going back to that idea of the body that disappears, uh, yeah, in the future version of this point, you will have a body. So you will have a virtual body which falls together with your real body. It will be so. Right? We'll also, yeah, we have a solution for that, yes. Right. And indeed, many people like you, or like academics who visit this installation, say like, oh, in fact, I'm the ghost, so uh, I, I'm the ghost uh, inside. And it's true, of course, because you're walking through walls and uh, you're not being acknowledged in this world uh, by the people walking in there. But also there, we have solutions. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, as we usually perform it, uh, it's always a world which is uh, several things at the same time. You're both ends type of thing, whereby now we have uh, Polonius and Gertrude and the Queen talking, but then Claudius may well be a live actor who then suddenly mm. turns to you, mm. oh, you're mm -hmm. still there, and, and then continues like this. So this creates a very different type of feeling inside, so which yes. is like a doubt you install. By no way we want to create uh, a total belief as, as this has been the ideology in movie making of total presence, so that you, it's really like, oh, I'm there. Uh, in fact, it is possible to achieve that. So in, in, in 2004 and five, we were making uh, video performances, uh, so omnidirectional video uh, in live embodied performances. So you were running around in buildings. The buildings you would see were the buildings you were in. Sometimes it was live, sometimes it was not. Sometimes it was here and now, sometimes it was here but not now, sometimes now but not here, sometimes not here but not now, sometimes but here and now. So this kind of mix which you quickly adapt to. Uh, but so at the beginning we really had people who 100% believed what they were seeing and doing, which was impossible because we still were working with cables, there was no possibility for wireless computers yet. Computers were big and were on trolleys and so we were running around. Mm -hmm. like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> just break the chair. I break yeah. the yeah. chair. <laughs> so, there's some physicality here. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then, uh, so that was one possibility of working with it. And in that, uh, at that moment, we came close to that uh, definition of presence as uh, the illusion of non-mediation, or mm -hmm. flatly saying, oh, this is real. Uh, but then this turned out not to be so interesting in terms of uh, what are we doing. Uh, and then the, the next step was if we make you, at the contrary, well aware that you are here, but maybe not here. So the two at the same time, the both ends, or the in-between. We used to call it also a zone of transition, a transition mm -hmm. zone. That was even more interesting. It was more interesting because from the moment we started working like that, and so even slow type of VR, uh, 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 out of body phenomena came strongly on the surface. So that's like a kind of a proof that the virtual medium is not made to be an illusionary type of thing. It's something, two things at the same time. And if you use it that way, you have this, this very strange phenomena, which have to do, of course, with the way we perceive. We perceive with the whole body, not only with the eyes. So in that way, it's, it's by nature distanced from cinema, uh, So because it involves the whole body. The working on the idea of the whole body, I must say in the beginning, rather in an experimental way, has led to interesting insights, like, uh, for instance, we made installations with projections, where you have a a perfect idea of 3D, I mean, 3D as, as I can see like this, using no 3D. I mean, uh, we didn't use stereoscopic projectors or things like that, or I mean, stereoscopic glasses. So we just wanted you to move, we track your position, we know where your eyes are, and because you are moving, and because we ask you to move, just close one eye, and suddenly you have one in front of you. Mm. So it's opposite to what we learn. So we see space as well with one eye, but so we see space because we move. Mm -hmm. So that comes but, again yeah. to, so because yeah. we move. Mm -hmm. And so I can make it even stronger with one eye than with two eyes. So that's the condition you have inside of these environments, of course. So it is necessary to move all the time. So all the performances we do are moving, and 
With VR, a new possibility came in that you can freely move, which you couldn't do before. I mean, we were moving with people all the time, but we knew where we wanted them to move to. Now they are kind of free. Still, the zone is restricted. Uh, next year, we will have very large zones, so you can walk in, and then it becomes even more interesting. So that was to comment upon the idea of the body that disappears, the, to the presence, language of cinema, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, both ends things, uh, and the in-between thing, in-betweenness of things. Uh, now, uh, to turn back to, to Hamlet, a question we often get is, uh, why Hamlet? Because, uh, of course, after all, it's an oral and textual thing, so, uh, whereas, yeah, VR is mainly visual type of thing. So, indeed, so we are not trying to reconstruct a Hamlet, uh, it's rather the, uh, the ideas which were behind Hamlet, and particularly the time behind Hamlet. So it was Hamlet was uh, in between two, was, yeah, it was in the middle, in between mm -hmm. of two eras, the 16th and the 17th century. The two, the two centuries are entirely different. Uh, the 16th century is still strongly linked to medieval beliefs. Uh, and the other one, so the Age of Enlightenment coming close, so in the 17th century. And in fact, the <coughs> period which spans Shakespeare's life and even Hamlet, so in 30 years' time, everything changed. <coughs> so, uh, we use as well the play, not here, but uh, parts about astronomy. So Shakespeare, in the beginning of his life, as in Hamlet, is still thinking in geocentric terms. Uh, and uh, the stars, actually, which appear in... Uh, in Hamlet are the star which we know to be the supernova of 1572 and things like that, westward from the pole, uh, observed by Tycho Brahe, who was going towards the heliocentricity of Copernicus, but not quite yet. Uh, and then so 30 years later, and Shakespeare as well, in, in King Lear, uh, starts thinking heliocentric. Uh, uh, so the whole cosmic order changed, and the cosmic order was at the root of many things. It was the belief, not simply of the Earth in the middle, but it was also this belief about the crystal spheres, and all these kind of things. Uh, uh, it was also the belief in the cosmic order being the god on top of everything, and the kings being in the middle, being the lieutenants or ministers of God, uh, which also in 30th time changes entirely. Since then, uh, uh, Charles I will be beheaded. Uh, so this whole belief of the divinity of the kings has gone. So in 30 years' time, a lot of things change. So we have science, which is being installed, the scientific method, this, the thing, things like that. So all that, we believe, is also in Hamlet. So Hamlet is, is, is on the verge of these two, is these two eras, and his doubt is as well these two entirely different yeah. frames of, of looking at the cosmic order of the world, so, uh, so to say. Yeah. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we are working with. So the, the Hamlet we have here is more like a database of things we will use in the final performance. It will be around Hamlet, uh, mm -hmm. and so yeah. as you call it, uh, yeah. uh, encountering Hamlet and yeah. an idea behind. Uh, I think I shall stop okay. here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we, we have time yeah. for some questions or comments from you, if you like to make some. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> and if you don't have questions, we have. We have lots of questions. <laughs> We're not in yeah. questions. I, have yeah. a, I have a question. It might come from my ignorance of your previous work, but it seems that this research that you are conducting uh, is funded by some European councils or something like that, because it seems to have already achieved so much. And yeah, well, we are rich, but. The, this the crew, crew. Yeah. crew yeah. Well, yeah, so we are, uh, we are a theatre company, uh, and we are being funded uh, for our work by, by the because government. Because the, the, the research questions that were yes. displayed um, look so much as part of a, a big project, so that's why mm -hmm. I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably also the way of doing it. Yeah. 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 My answer would be here working at a university, so a lot of money for doing research is in the Netherlands centralized. So um. we have to apply for extra money to get uh, more research time than your regular time that you have given your specific position. Right. But the chance that you get the money is less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So many scholars write endlessly proposals and 
all those proposals that don't get money, that's all lost time, lost yeah, energy, know, lost a lot of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So that's horrible. Yeah. So, and I have no, done the privilege. Uh, because how, how are you managing to um, work with equipment, to um, yeah, set so up uh, labs and so on, to do all the... So what I did from my the perspective, I tried to find my allies oh, right. in the field. Okay. So I went to Eric and I said, hey, should we do something together? Right. I have some ideas and uh, we have a Hamlet and you have the tools and a lot of experience with working these tools. You've done many, many projects. Let's sit together and see what we can do. This is yeah. actually how we did it. So we rented an apartment in uh, Brussels, and right. instead of being in posh, uh, expensive hotel rooms. So we, we did everything on a low budget scale yeah. in Amazing. order to create time and, and think together what we can do. Yeah. That, that's one of my, yeah. so from my perspective, one of my strategies to guarantee that at least the research time that I have is used in a very productive way instead of me sitting behind a desk writing a proposal with less than 10% chance that I actually get the money. Okay, okay. Well, uh, a couple of questions on here. And the um, sorry, this is going to come as a bit naive or blunt, but I haven't formulated that question particularly precisely. One of the uh, big, uh, not criticism, but a big doubt about VR since it's been kind of like going around is that uh, it creates an immersive environment where uh, we lose critical distance. Yeah. So the distance necessary for us to be critical vis-a-vis -vis what we see. Um, and of course, I mean, we can see how this is connected to the good old Cartesian yeah. notion of body and mind. And yeah. No knowledge can be gained from uh, the body's experience, etc. But how do you um, how do you deal with that particular kind of well, like? Uh, we're very keen question. not to have that kind of immersion, as Eric said. We're not creating that. Other companies do that with VR, but that's not what we want to do at all. Precisely because, as you say, we want to create critical space. So in all cruise productions I've been been to, there's always an outside as well as an inside. So there's a section in which in Terra Nova, for example, where you are in uh, a VR installation and you might say, well, I'm really immersed in that world. But then you're also outside observing other people go through the installation. So here you're watching the screen. I mean, even this little experiment here, we're saying while you're waiting, look what's happening to other people. So there's always a space for reflection. And the other thing is precisely this um, drawing attention to the body. So the going down the stairs bit that we mentioned a couple of times, if that kind of thing is deliberately to make you aware that you have an actual body in actual space. So you have, wait a minute, you have to, I mean in the moment of doing it, it's, it's, a, it's experiential, it's body-mind experiential. But afterwards you think, hey, what, what was going on there? You know? And then you watch somebody else and you see them going down the stairs and they're going down, you know, say reaching the hammer. You think, why are they doing that? They're on a flat floor. And you realize that's what's going on. So always there are devices, if you like, to um, maximize critical reflection in space. Yeah. If I add, may add one thing, our favorite reference point in this discussion are uh, Wagner on the one side and Kandinsky on the other yeah. side. Yeah. Wagner, who is trying to overwhelm the audience, yeah. hide the machinery for the sake of a perfect illusion. And that's what Nietzsche says is the disease of our times. Yeah. And Wagner, he literally says, Wagner is the disease of our times. Yeah. And there were wonderful fantasies about Wagner when he, if he would have lived in the 20th century, of course he would have gone to Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> for many reasons. And yeah. would have become a very rich man. Yeah. Kandinsky is the one who is talking about the frictions, the clashes, the theater functioning as a hidden magnet and really a battle between the different art forms yeah. and that's our reference point yeah. so I, I, I so my idea of intermediality as an intensification of the performativity of arts is very much about being aware we are making worlds we are staging worlds we are staging media it's all about self-reference self-reflection and so on but at the same time we are not naive in the sense that Yes, we are so used to be aware of how things are made that that in itself is not a, nest, not a sufficient yeah. condition to yeah. be critical. Yeah. So we are not in that sense uh, naive. Yeah. So 
Brecht is as well a reference point, yeah. but making us aware of the construction is yeah. not enough to create the distance for reflection. May I Something add a like practical that. thing to that? So, uh, so we've had performances. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Time short. Or? No, no, no. We're fine. Oh, okay. So we had performances about astronomy, uh, which were no narratives at all, uh, and it was inside and outside. And so the idea was to show people uh, different versions of the solar system to make them understand why did people understand the solar system at that step like that. Okay. So using this technology so we had people scientists explaining something with a lecture like this one there over there we were doing a performance with people with helmets who would be inside of universes and then you had people with tablets who could see what are they seeing inside things like that and then actors were talking to them and there was a virtual actor with a mocap guide live to introduce them inside of that virtual world now, uh, so you, but it's important to s the person inside and outside. So the person inside, what he sees, for instance, is so if if we have a basketball which is being tracked, so we, we have a basketball on a line, so he sees the planet turning around him. We know that he sees it like that. That's like in Ptolemaic times, they thought it was an abstract point around which the planets were circling. That's how he sees. At the outside, we know it's not like that. We see a line. So the line is 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 a force, and then. If we tilt the camera in, from above, you see that it's not a circle, it's an ellipse. And you immediately understand why, because of course you have to pull the ball to get into motion and then you have to, to break, because otherwise it needs to come back. So automatically you understand why it's an ellipse, but well, that's Kepler already. So this inside and this outside, uh, you have to see both to, the, so to have an immediate conclusion. <laughs> so, uh, so it adds to the understanding, so it's the distance, there's less distance, and it's, it's, it's several things at the same time. Uh, but the inside and outside you need. So that's a simple example, but you can take that much further. So in that sense, using media in plural like that, uh, I think it's, it adds to the critical distance because you can switch between close, nearby, but you can do this all the time. So you can compare as well. So when this is the development will be into a bigger space and various activities, as you move, as it were, between activities, it gives a space for critical reflection, some of which will be just sitting watching. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> no, no, no. I would have actually several questions. Uh, one is like more like uh, from dramaturgical point of view, like whether are you using consciously video game mechanics? and also are you using gaps in telling the story and how much player agency are you giving to, in, in terms of narrative, <laughs> are you giving agency to the players? There are questions that we're wrestling with at the moment, but oh. that's a good question <laughs> yeah. to raise, yeah. I mean, if you have the, the, the space we're perceiving at the moment like a playground with different activities that you go through, so how do people go through that? How much agency can you give people? I mean, to some extent, people need to be guided through some bits of the experience to get the most out of them but we would like to maximize agency it's quite a different and then we've also talked a lot i'm very keen on blast theory i don't know if you know blast theory's work who very much use the game strategy of a quest or something you know and maybe i don't know we, we're still talking about this maybe we need something that the 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 experiencer is given a task to do as they go through these different activities, which would be another dimension. So how you move people through time in a theatre, you know, time durational theatre piece, is a, is an important question to us. But I, all I can say at the moment is we would look to maximise agency. Though we're aware that you know, it's not a kind of open concept because sometimes it's better to people to be guided to some extent. And within a VR, for example, some people need reassurance. I mean, it's a discomforting experience. You don't want to be discomforting in the wrong kind of way, so you may need a guide there. So, but the idea would be to maximize agency, and maybe there's a quest. This is one for Eric. Yeah, so, yeah, so if you have more agency, you have less story or less narrative. Yeah. If you have more narrative, you have less agency. So people all the time tell like, oh, so why can't we have more freedom? And then why is there no more story? So it's, it's, all the t it's, it's, it's like that. But so, but you need both. So. Uh, that's why we have a guide inside. So actually, it were some historians who explained to us, so if you take the pre-cinema times, the operator, uh, with the thing, he was in the middle of the performance. He was explaining what you were seeing, and he was in the middle of everything. 
So in modern cinema, we no longer have. So he's moved into the back. But so that idea of operator, we took back here. So there is. So we had uh, the first version was a scripted version, uh, and then we said, no, we need again that type of guide. So I'm literally talking to you. Uh, not really to guide you, but uh, how to say, there's an awareness, there's a presence, there's a lightness inside, so you have something to talk to. We noticed that because uh, Robin and Hill were taking notice of the experiences of the, the people inside. Uh, so uh, if you leave them alone, you will have banal questions like, oh, uh, is this what I'm supposed to do? Uh, am I not missing anything? So yeah. you have these preoccupations, preoccupations which are bad for everything. So, but as soon as you have someone in there, it's gone, so you know he's going to tell you at a moment, so maybe we should better now take the stairs or something like that, or would you like to do this or would you like to do that? So you have a dialogue which you install. So the agency is something you negotiate in a very soft way. So there is a presence and there is a kind of path to follow, but it's a bit up to you, depending on who you are. I can feel a bit who you are. Now, of course, it's very short, so uh, it's very pragmatic. But if we have more time, I have more time to listen to you as well. So that's that's the way to go through these environments, and which is a solution for this agency versus narrative type of thing, I, I think. So. so because it's an installation and it's time-based, I mean, everyone has a limited time to attend it. Here, yeah. Here, yeah. Uh, yes. But uh, you are planning to, to yeah. give yes. um, more time yes. to people. I just, yes. It might be a good moment if you can just hold your question um, to show you a little <laughs> clip of the iteration in Brussels um, last year. Last year, this year, earlier this year, and it just gives you some idea of the the space. So it's introduced by an actor playing Hamlet, who takes you into the piece. So I'll just play, play the open. I'll skip through a, a few bits here, and you get some idea of, of the because you know, we've Absolute explained classics in Western drama. His personality, the intrigue. His dilemmas, his actions and inactions have engaged audiences worldwide, aiming to understand Hamlet from within its own time and space. We now suggest that the key problem of Hamlet is the time and the space. Bear with me. Hamlet is situated at the turn of the 16th towards the 17th century, a time where a great shift was taking place from the medieval <coughs> belief system to one of pre-modernity. Love that word, pre-modernity. <laughs> Human beings were trying to understand the world and the universe and their place in that world. And this has always been present in the works of Shakespeare, of course. And the fault line runs directly through Hamlet. The central dilemma of Hamlet is the question how to act ethically in a conflicting world. What is right and wrong is shifting moment by moment. And when we look at Hamlet from within our own time, we can notice many similarities. A 21st century filled with shifting moral values and fake news. So join us and find out where you might stand. So he sets up a range of ideas and takes us into the big space. To Hamlet encounters. I hope you're seated well and that you can hear me just fine. Okay. I want you to imagine yourself in the 16th century. And let us consider the universe from a most peculiar perspective. Okay. Namely, the one from God's throne. Okay, I'm going to skip through this a bit. So you've got a section These there. These specific uh, positions point. are eternal. Where um, people are having a VR, some people are having a VR experience. And in another part of the space, there were members of the audience, if you can call them that, experiences as I call them, who were being put into mocap suits. So they then were um, dropped into the castle world with the actors. So they had a costume put on them. So you had Hamlet and Ophelia, who were experiences who come next to the Hamlet and Ophelia that you see in this installation. Are you with me? 
And then there were, pi there were moments when you were sat on the side, so people sitting down there, who were actually watching. So they're the kind of moments of reflection that we talk about. Well, you have to tell what's going on there, what's going on there. And then in turn, you go through the experiences. And then we get through towards the end. I won't play it all through it too long. Um, but we get a, a, a thing on cosmology, that it was Eric was talking about that, the informative bit about uh, cosmology. And there's also an experience within that, is it in the VR? No, it's on the big screen, isn't it? Where do we see the stars? If you've done the, the experience here, at the end, we, we zoom you out, as it were, into the stars, and you're hanging in space in the stars, <laughs> then there's a screen version of that, which is also talking through the cosmology of the times. So just to give you a sense of, there's different things going on in the space. Order unchanging. I'll just, um, People believed that the And the actor playing the Hamlet is in a mocap suit now, so he is also appearing within the installation. Spheres, so again, people are crossing the, the worlds of the, of the piece. Is that making And it was the outer sphere that so rotated every 24 and then you hours. Have see if you can get the same world you have there, but then bit. that virtual actor is alive present in that world. So Look at him go. As I'm doing now, he's there see. with a body and takes you around. planets moving a little bit. Okay, oh, I'm going to jump through a bit. the ladder, you get further away from God and so the you can. Oh, you can see the, the, of the human ranking system. You get the sense of uh, there's the projections on the big screen, the and followed closely you can project on the big screen what people are seeing in the installation and so on. So it's a kind of the universe start very fluid experience, the, but lots of different things that, as I would say, bang against each other, and that's what, so what is, I would argue, of no critical stage. Uh, this is just uh, things in the studio that you, the, the making world. These are the underneath them. experiences in mocha. Aim your eyes to the skies once more. And this is a, a director who's directing the experiences in mocap suits and then dropping them into, yeah, preparing them to be dropped into the virtual world. Are you with me? So you can be B Hamlet or Ophelia. It needs more preparation and time. I mean, to get everybody, um, say you've got 50 people in the audience, you've got to get 50 people into mocap suits. I mean, we, that's a nice idea, I think, but it's probably too logistically difficult to do. And then they can all be in the world as well. But then you My need Lord. to prepare them what to do in the world. One of the problems I, I think we had here was that um, once we got them into the world, what were they going to do? Because they hadn't learnt the lines of Hamlet. If they had, they could have played out the Hamlet Ophelia scene next to the actors who had learned the lines who were in the VR already. So, but you know, that playing with those things. Yeah. The idea wasn't it to make, not to ask them to act or to do something, but just to, to be there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so by being there, there would be kind of a natural uh, population inside the world, which was then looked upon by the artists, eh? like you know, a small maquette. And so, oh, well, here, there he is, there he is, what he's doing. Yeah. So, uh, so that would be a kind of a likeness inside. Yeah. Uh, which was not easy to install. No, it was difficult. <laughs> so anyway, does, does that give you an idea of the bigger yeah. event? I mean, yeah. yeah, okay. So let's come back to your question now. Yeah. You wanted yeah, to ask I, it. My yeah. question uh, was, rela was related to time, yep. actually. I was wondering uh, if the, the technology of VR uh, establishes some specific rules of time, uh, of the experience. and. If you if you encounter this, because you, you said it, it's about ten minutes yeah. and here, yes. here. Yes. Yes. I was wondering if uh, if it is possible for the body to experience a long term experience yeah, yeah. and also in the design of the experience. I mean, uh, th aspects like speed or uh, the rhythm, uh, <coughs> speed some, or? or or the rhythm. Of, of the narrative or of yes. the, the action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you encounter some restrictions about this? Or yes. Yeah, restrictions are, are simply financial. Because <laughs> <So laughs> <laughs> uh, all theaters want to have as many people <laughs> as possible. Ah. <laughs> and you want, as, as, as a maker, you want to have a, a good dialogue with the person inside. So you want a maximum of time and preoccupation with the people inside. So that's, that's, a, that's a conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of how long can it be, we, we experimented, so we, 
I think six hours is a maximum. So mm. we, yeah, uh, yeah. we we try twenty four hours inside. But I mean, so, uh, after three hours, you you, you yeah. your head starts a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I th yeah. after after five hours, you I mean everything starts aging. You really want to get out. So mm -hmm. we, yeah. we we try to build special equipment so to soften that. But it's it's too <laughs> your your body yeah. uh, physically starts yeah. revealing, yeah. but not against the image or something. Not the idea of presence. That's not a problem. The problem is quite simply. The, the tools, yeah, the, uh, the tools uh -huh. around you, uh, but but it's also true that so uh, uh, ten minutes is very short. I would say that uh, forty-five minutes is perfect. Mm -hmm. In forty-five minutes, and in the past we we can no longer do this because it's too expensive. But in the past we really prepared it, so we took you outside. We started by walking and with headphones. You walked through the through the city, and we mm -hmm. made you come in. You were put into the dark, and then we would slowly do something with you to disorient you completely. So we have, yeah, I have a picture, we have a wheel for instance, we can yeah. put you in, we turn you upside down with your head down and you will not know what your position is. So that's yeah. the perfect thing. So mm. just to, to mm. take you into a completely different type of environment, so you get out and you, you, you hook on what you see and you feel different. But that was a very good way to prepare. You, you did this yeah. type of things many yeah. times, I think. <laughs> and, and, and Yes, and that can take very long, very long, because this, this, this thing of going, so the, the procedure of really moving into it was actually the thing. Mm -hmm. And when you get out, uh, that was also the thing. Yeah. So someone used the word liminal somewhere. Yeah. It really was getting out. So people like, no, you, you just don't say anything. Just leave my city here for, <laughs> for 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, really to, 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 to adapt again. I mean, in, in a very it's, basic yeah. sense, like, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we no longer have this because you need this procedure, I think. And also, yeah, that's also a funny thing. That's because we also already changed. We, in fact, the first years we were working with it, we needed it. Mm -hmm. because people got sometimes uh, dizzy or ill or mm -hmm. things like that and to prevent it we had to do it that way but this is no longer necessary so we in a way we already uh, uh, but so yeah but I still think that that yeah. using these technologies means that our senses are so radically uh, redefined mm -hmm. and that it's such a complex uh, thing to negotiate with your body what you perceive by your eyes and ears, mm -hmm. that you immediately sense, so to say, your natural awareness of the passing by of time. So already after um, 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you don't have a clear sense of how many time, mm -hmm. how, how much, how, mm -hmm. how long you've been in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that more and more emphasizes how much uh, the experience of the world around us is. Uh, very much based on all kinds of routines mm -hmm. uh, where we are so much used to think that's how life is that's how the real world is but it tells us more about the habits that we've developed mm -hmm. than about the physical world itself yeah. mm -hmm. but the same is true in theater right? in fact in the theater you have also the ritual of getting in and waiting yeah. dark mm -hmm. yeah. silence yeah yeah, uh, yeah. 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 someone told me that the, the, the clapping at the end in fact is Getting back to your body, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, making yeah. contact again. So yeah. Ooh, here we are again. So, <laughs> so it's relieve me with yeah. Well, yeah. What's yeah. the Shakespeare sentence? Relieve me from my bands with the help of your good hands or something yes. like that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 So you could do the whole of the five hour, fifty five minutes of Hamlet, the longest possible version in VR, okay, yeah. if you want. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't. So. Okay, we have another question here, yeah. And one thing that could uh, interest me is, um, you said that you um, um, yeah, talk to the people about their experience. Uh, yeah. So m maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, how you record it, uh, or how you document it. Some, actually, something like uh, as interesting as out-of-body experience or something like this. So um, how you deal with this? Okay, well, in uh, various ways. I mean, the, in, in Belgrade, so we had about 100 people, I think, go through the experience in three days. And we simply got them to make notes like we're doing here. And then I transcribed all the notes and went through the notes and kind of pulled them together for different kind of reactions. And one of the dominant reactions was people saying they felt like the ghost, which we, we fully understand, but it's 
kind of, I think, not what we want because we want more kind of engagement in there, which is part of the idea that we need an actor to turn around suddenly and address you. And then you think, hey, wait a minute, I'm here as well. Anyway, but that was a dominant reaction. Um, people f uh, were wowed by the experience. That was perhaps the most dominant reaction. Everybody said, wow, that was amazing, you know. But in terms of um, feedback to us, uh, it was the fact that they felt invisible and they enjoyed that sense of invisibility and we think, oh, well, hang on, that's not kind of working how we want, really. We have to have some devices that will draw attention to their being in the world as well. And then also we have recordings uh, sometimes of people um, ask if you just to record on a phone and we've got some downloaded sort of mini interviews, if you like, with people talking about their experience and how it felt. And that's really useful. So we've got a kind of body now of, of feedback. And so that's why we're asking people here just to write down what they feel. So, and, and, and you would like to, like, the, you, you get the insights and you, you, then you will publish something on it? or, or We or might in the end, yes. yes. I mean, at some point, I said I'd write an article about this, but I've got so much documentation now, it could be a five-volume book, I think. But yeah, I think we will, you know, uh, Keel and I are professional scholars, as it were, and um, so we will probably pu publish something at some point. I haven't got around to it yet, but we will do, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's also good to know, which is also part of, our methodology yeah. that our discussions are all recorded. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, oh, we yeah. cannot because it's a lot of material. Though. What you're yeah. doing, yeah, it's a lot oh. of material. But what you're doing actually occurs in the process of thinking together and, mm. and exchanging ideas. Uh, I very much believe that that things happen in the process of writing and talking with each other and playing with the mm. tools. You can't imagine it beforehand. Mm. You need to do it. Mm. It's all in the doing, so yeah. to say, that it occurs. Well, we started off um, in the studio for about a day and a half talking, and uh, three of us, and Maya, and Anita, and various other people coming in now. And you just got this new 360-degree camera, and it was all recorded. Yeah, we got, yeah, we, we got a new, yeah, it was a, with six cameras. Yeah. It was 34 terabytes. <laughs> but in the end, <laughs> before we had time to transcribe it, we had to wipe the data because it was taking up all the memory on the computers. <laughs> so that wasn't very successful. But we did have a lot of, of uh, record of that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> And then half of it was thrown away. Half of it got lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The disc, the disc needed to the be thrown, thrown away. The best bits were thrown away. First Toy Story was <laughs> one terabyte. Yeah. Just one imagine. brilliant moment. So it were seven cameras yeah. in 8K uh, recording all the time. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it was too much. But it yeah, was yeah. interesting. Yeah. But it's a very important part of the work because, you know, I'm coming, it's about the experience. And if we're making claims about the experiences people have, we need some kind of evidence of what they do. And I've assessed a lot of PhDs where people make claims about what their practice is doing to people, and you think, well, how do you know that? Now, you can't do another PhD of audience research study, but you can have some evidence, and that's what we do. I call it anecdotal, but I take the anecdotal seriously. So that's really what we've got, a body of anecdotal evidence that brings out whether it's working in the kind of way we would like it to work, and say so we sometimes discover, well, it isn't. And then you have to go back and say, well, maybe we need to do something else with the dramaturgy to, to facilitate that better, yeah. Well, specifically to the out of bodies you're referring to, so mm -hmm. inside of the EU project, we did research upon okay. that. So, mm -hmm. so it was with, uh, yeah, neurologists beside, and so you had all these tests with... Uh, of, of, of both, both special parts, or...? Yeah, there was one performance uh, that was in 2010, that was, uh, and it was documented and it was precisely to understand, so where did this come from? Uh, and it was also a neurologist who, uh, while uh, treating patients for uh, tinnitus, uh, found that uh, uh, he uses uh, transcranial stimulation, magnetic stimulation, uh, and using some particular parts, he got some patients having out-of-body effects, like strange, I'm sitting near to myself, and things like that. So the, 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 the way the, the, way the, the brain mix, starts mixing up things, so it was a help to understand what is happening. In fact, the answer was pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. mm. It's because we no longer think in this idea of an image as a purely visual thing. The moment mm -hmm. you start mixing a tactile information and visual thing, you, you start mixing up the location of the self, and if you start playing with that in you know, dramaturgy, you, you can evoke quite easily out-of-body effects. Uh, but then you first of all need an embodiment. So it's more a dramaturgical thing than a technical thing. Of course you need that type of technology, 
But so sometimes we had during this life, and it were live performances. It's it's live. So we sometimes had the question of, of, of people saying, "How can I be standing there while I'm here?" And then the answer obviously was, "What well, is a camera? <laughs> <laughs> you're looking. The camera is there, and you're looking at yourself now. But you're providing your body to the camera. Yes, yes. But because the concept <laughs> before was there that." You were in the middle of the image, you were walking, I'm walking towards you, so you come close at this idea, and now suddenly you switch to another image, and you see yourself, you, 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 you're confused, that, oh, boy, this is I, this is not I, I'm here, I'm there, you, you have this kind of mix up, but, mm -hmm. so it's a dramaturgical thing. But, of course, it, 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 it can only pop up in a medium like this, and then mm -hmm. the interesting thing, of course, is that since then, so, uh, you know, all media we have are full of senses, so in a way, uh, all media are embodied in a way nowadays because they are all linked in a way to what you do, what you say, what you. Mm. So the, so yeah, so we are uh, yeah, in the middle. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so interesting. Uh, this morning, um, Thomas Elsasser referred to uh, Münsterberg, mm. uh, which. Uh, talking about how the mechanics of cinematography function like the hierarchical principles of the human mind. And you very much become aware that in that sense a camera is not exactly doing what we are doing in our mind and what happens when. So how you relate with your body to what you see happening in the head-mounted display is still quite different from what would have happened if you would be as a human in the position of the camera. Mm -hmm. So, well, that keeps us alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we're collapsing distance here. I was interested that Thomas emphasized the distance. Yes. And yes. what this does is collapse the distance. And Thomas came and had the experience shortly after his lecture. He liked it. He liked and he it. immediately yeah. said to Eric, now I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, are there any okay. final questions? Because we must just about wind up, I think. You want to say anything? No. 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 Okay. Well, thank you to my panelists and thank you very much for coming.